So hello to everybody, Camelia. I'm Paula, responsible of the communication activity from DG Connect in coordinating uh, the conference activities. Camelia is the expert communication officer in your file. So thank you very much for being here. The idea was today for um, to give you the opportunity to see and to hear from the, the directors of the three flagships we, we currently have, uh, the Human Brain Project, Graphene and Quantum, to know and to let them know what are the flagships and what they are doing and to answer the questions that you always wanted to ask. So I will invite the three directors to explain, to give you a, a, a short, short explanation uh, of their flagship and um, and then you can ask uh, the, the questions. So may I introduce Yari? Hi, so uh, my name is Yari Kinaret. Uh, I'm uh, the director of the, um, the Graphene flagship. I'm also a professor of physics uh, at uh, Chalmers University of Technology uh, in uh, Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the uh, the, uh, the flagships, but uh, the Human Brain Project and we uh, were launched in 2013. So we've been uh, operating uh, well, just over uh, uh, five years. So we are about halfway through. The flagships uh, are supposed to be 10 years, at least uh, the first two. I don't know if it's the same for the uh, future flagships. Uh, the Graphene flagship is probably the one that has a, a highest uh, technology readiness level. We have a number of products. I think the latest count was something like 30 products that have been launched by our partners. We have created a number of spin-off companies, somewhere between six and 10, depending on exactly uh, how you uh, do the definition. And uh, we uh, cover a very broad area uh, of, uh, of topics, anything from uh, materials production related to graphene or other two-dimensional materials. Graphene. Uh, maybe I should explain, is a, a very narrow, one atomic layer, uh, thin uh, sheet of carbon atoms uh, organized in a, like a hexagonal pattern. It was the first so-called two-dimensional material uh, that was, uh, uh, has been studied. The study started in 2010 uh, in connection with, uh, or 2004 actually, and then 2010 the Nobel Prize was awarded by, uh, by two people involved in our flagship. Uh, Konstantin Novoselov and Andre Game. Uh, since 2004, many other two-dimensional materials have been discovered. So while our flagship is called Graphene Flagship, it covers graphene and related two-dimensional materials. And uh, there are applications in uh, uh, many different areas. We have uh, people who look into uh, uh, biomedical uh, technologies, people who look at electronics, uh, composite materials, uh, battery technologies and so on. And uh, today we have about 150 partners, about 40% are uh, companies, either big companies uh, that uh, you know, like Ericsson and Nokia and so on, uh, Airbus, or small companies that you probably are not familiar with. 40% uh, of partners are, are universities, uh, uh, and the remaining 20% are research institutes and so on. Uh, they come from uh, 22 countries in Europe. Uh, all in all, we have uh, almost 500 full-time equivalent people working on the flagship. The number of individuals engaged in the work is uh, considerably larger, maybe 1,200, 1,300, something like that. Uh, like all the other flagships, we have an uh, uh, exhibit downstairs where we show uh, more concretely what we are doing, uh, some of the results, uh, some of the... Uh, the uh, 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 the plans that we have made. Now, I should also point out that in addition to this uh, uh, part of the flagship that is funded by the European Commission, uh, the uh, EU member states uh, fund uh, a lot of related activities uh, in the form of partnering projects or associated members, and that's actually the part where the, uh, we see uh, most of the growth of the flagship in terms of new partners. So today we have something like 80 uh, associated members uh, all over Europe both companies and universities. And, uh, uh, I don't really know what I should uh, tell you now, so it's maybe easiest if uh, you ask questions, uh, either now or we can continue the discussion downstairs, but uh, now would be a good time to start. Okay. 
Okay, fine with me. No. Hello, my name is Christian Fauteur. I'm the executive director of the Human Brain Project. Um, my role in the Human Brain Project is mostly in coordination and management, so I'm based in Geneva. Uh, I work for EPFL, which is the coordinator of uh, the HPP. So like uh, Graphene, the HPP started five years ago. Uh, we're now halfway through. Um, the HPP is, is a bit different than Graphene, as Yari explained. Uh, we're, we're studying the brain and we're helping uh, researchers to study the brain in new ways. And we're also developing new technologies on, our, on the basis of what we're, we're learning about the brain. Why are we doing this? Because, as you know, uh, brain diseases and brain uh, pathologies are a very important uh, issue in Europe and around the world. We want to help these people, and we, we need to find new ways to do that. And We've been building in the last five years a very strong consortium. We have more than 120 partners in, in the HPP. Uh, and 19 countries are involved in Europe. And uh, also we have lots of partnerships around the world with the US Brain Initiative, with the Australian Brain Initiative, etc. And uh, we're also developing new partnerships with um, projects that are um, working in the same fields uh, in Europe, in the US, etc. We have, um, we're working on, on, on learning about the brain, exploring the brain from the genes to uh, the functions of the brain going through the cells, uh, the neurons, the, the brain circuits, the brain regions. We have people looking at the anatomy of the, of the brain. We also have um, theorit theoreticians uh, creating models of the brain. We, ha we are building six platforms that form the research infrastructure that we are providing to the European research community and the world um, to uh, facilitate brain research, to share data, to make it available to the world, and to, <laughs> and to make these new tools uh, available to neuroscientists and uh, also clinicians uh, to, to really um, make some progress towards uh, solving the issues of the brain. The third um, aspect that I mentioned earlier, which is developing new technologies on the basis of our knowledge of the brain. Um, I can mention a few. Um, we are developing uh, chips that are based on brain circuitry. We call them the neuromorphic chips. We have the two most, uh, one of the two most advanced platforms for neuromorphic computing that we make available to researchers in Europe and around the world. Uh, one is based in uh, Heidelberg. It's the brain scales platform based on emulating uh, brain circuitry uh, physically with analog chips. And the other is in Manchester. It's called Spinnaker. It's a digital emulation of the brain. We also have um, a very strong network of high performance computing centers that, we, that uh, make available resources to European researchers to use to simulate the brain and to analyze uh, brain data. And finally, we have the Neurobotics platform, which is a, um, a platform in which brain models are put in virtual environments uh, and also in physical environments to close the loop and, 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 uh, and relate the, the brain model to st outside stimuli. We have uh, developed in the past few uh, years also a number of medical applications. Uh, we can think of uh, the virtual brain, for example, which is a uh, a simulation of a patient's brain that is used to target uh, surgeries for epilepsy, for example, or other diseases, maybe in the future. And we have uh, a large network of hospitals that have joined the project and that are making uh, available anonymized patient data for clinicians to, uh, to search. I can introduce uh, you to a few people that are uh, today present at the boot in, in the HPP uh, in the hall there. Um, Professor uh, Jan Vialli, who is the infrastructure director, is also the head of the neuroinformatics uh, uh, sub-project in HPP. Uh, Professor Petra Ritter at Charité University Medicine in Berlin, who, who heads the, the virtual brain. Uh, Professor uh, hans eckhardt Tesser at the Norwegian University of the Life Sciences, who is in uh, high-performance computing. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Grubel, Andreas Grubel, who is a senior researcher at the University of Heidelberg, who works on the Brain Scales platform, and uh, Sasha von Albada at Forschungszentrum Julisch, uh, who is a group leader there. 
She works on um, data-driven modeling and also uh, large-scale cortical uh, software simulations. And Mark Oliver Gewaldik, who just showed up, who is at EPFL, uh, who is uh, involved in the, he's the deputy leader of the Neurobotics uh, sub-project. Thank you. Many thanks. So maybe the third project? So, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Thierry de Boucher from Thales, so a company in France. I'm located in Paris. Uh, and I'm involved in the Quantum Flagship, which is the third flagship that has been launched. And it has started uh, in, in October, so it's very new as compared to the, to the two other ones. So, it is also planned for 10 years. And uh, the goal uh, of the Quantum Flagship is to uh, transfer uh, the, the properties of the matter at the quantum level uh, towards applications and to try to develop applications from the quantum properties of matters of matter. Um, so the quantum properties of matter are very special. Uh, if you consider uh, a single system, an atom, for example, uh, it can be uh, in two different states at the same time. This is what is called superposition. And it can go from one state to the one and back and, and forth in a coherent way. So it is reversible and this is what is specific to quantum. Uh, with, with a single quantum de device you can already develop sensors for example which have unprecedented um, uh, properties and sensitivity as compared to classical sensors. Uh, but if you go further uh, you can consider for example two uh, uh, quantum systems which are which have which are correlated and we call this entanglement and the properties if you measure the properties of one system you immediately see the effect on the other one w whatever is the distance between them there is no transfer inf of information between them and this is specific to quantum and this get reads to uh, quantum communication for example which uh, allow to develop uh, things such as uh, quantum key distribution uh, which will uh, allow to bring secret keys with provable security between two parties, or what is called teleportation. This is the, the, the possibility to transfer a quantum state from, from one place to another one without exchanging matter in between. So this is very specific to, to, to quantum. And then there is a next step if you consider not only two, but a, a large set of quantum devices, which are all connected and all entangled. Then you can exploit this to do quantum simulation which will allow you to uh, simulate uh, big devices, for example, in solid state physics, which you cannot, you cannot simulate with classical uh, computers. Or even further, you can do quantum computing, where we will develop uh, computers which have what we call the quantum speed up, uh, which means that it's possible to do com uh, 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 computation in a, in a time scale which, which is exponentially uh, quicker than classical computers. So this is in the long term. So uh, now if we consider application, quantum sensing and quantum communication are short or medium, medium term application. Quantum simulation and quantum computing are more in the long term. So this is why the project is lasting for 10 years, uh, which will allow us to, to progress in all those directions. So since we are working, uh, we are uh, speaking about applications, uh, the, there is, this is not only a research project, but uh, this also concerns industry. And there are uh, many industrial partners which are involved uh, in the quantum project, the current flagship. For example, I'm from, from Thales, which is a company and not a, a university. And there are many other examples of companies which are already involved in the project. Uh, so the quantum flagship has started in October, uh, so it's very new. Uh, and uh, it has started with 20 projects that have been selected. There was a call uh, starting last year, and at the end there were 20 projects that were selected among 140, so a huge amount of selection. And the projects cover the four pillars that I've mentioned previously, sensing, communication, simulation, and computing, plus basic science, because basic science is a very important part of the activity, or relies on the study and the deep understanding of quantum mechanics. And there is also a coordination action which will uh, help to support uh, these activities and I'm part of this, uh, this support action. Uh, okay, so now we, uh, we have a booth uh, in the exhibition in Hall uh, X4 and C5, so you, 
you can go there and see more, uh, discuss with us more in detail, and you can see some experiments, some tabletop experiments, uh, which involve, for example, uh, entanglement. And um, so I hope I didn't miss anything, and if you have a question, I'm there for, to answer them. Yes, many thanks for the explanation, and indeed you can meet all this project in the exhibition area. Any question from press? Are you yes? Uh, how um, close we are to see what we see in sci-fi movies teleporting via quantum and in terms because there is a lot of debate in the technology world about quantum are we there yet uh, where are we yeah uh, in fact we are not working in sci-fi we are working on the concrete uh, experiments and applications uh, all of this is very real and serious uh, and there are different levels of achievements uh, depending on the pillar that you're considering. Uh, for example, concerning sensing uh, and communication, there are already products which are available. Uh, you, you, you can buy a, a, a quantum key distribution encryptor. It's, it's already available from companies, uh, from startup companies in Europe. Uh, and concerning uh, sensors, for example, there are already uh, a lot of developments concerning atomic clocks, which are uh, a real product, uh, which is uh, very, very necessary for all communication, for synchronization of communications all over the world or with satellites, for example. Uh, and you have also atomic size uh, sensors, such as uh, nitrogen vacancy in diamond, which is a small defect that we implant in a, dim a pure diamond crystal, and which allow us to, for example, to do some uh, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging of a single molecule. The, the usual uh, uh, NMR is possible only with large ensembles of, of molecules due to the lack of sensitivity, which such devices were able to uh, monitor to uh, to, uh, to, to study one single molecule, which opens a lot of applications concerning uh, medicine, uh, drugs, uh, and, and so on. Yes? Uh, no, not, not, not to me. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I am yes. Antonio Grasso from Italy. I want to know which level of convergence between HBP and uh, artificial neural networks in uh, now or in the future, you know, statistical model, mathematical model from artificial neural networks, how they can converge with your project in the HBP? I think it's possible, but I have many experts there that can answer the question. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So we, we are exploring the possibilities of um, learning from the brain on how to learn. Um, we have very interesting activity in uh, our sub-project 4, which is the theoretical neuroscience part, where um, colleagues like Wolfgang Maas are very actively um, exploring um, new learning patterns, so extending machine learning um, from which most of machine learning, a lot of what is today called AI, is essentially just linear algebra in a nice wrapping. But the brain doesn't work by matrices. The brain works using spikes. And uh, Wolfgang Maas and colleagues are exploring how to use um, these spikes in advanced learning algorithms to really learn much faster. And then we have the uh, colleagues in the neuromorphic computing um, platform who are building systems that can execute these algorithms at uh, very high speed and by bringing those two components together um, we are uh, looking forward to making important contributions there also in the uh, AI machine learning uh, area by learning from the brain and transferring from the brain uh, to, to applications. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, follow up? Yeah. 
just to put it simply, so if you look at if you look at um, artificial neural networks, machine learning today, it basically bases on the knowledge of the brain from the 1950s. Yeah, a lot has been discovered since then, in particular when it comes to the functioning of the connections between the neurons, where the learning takes place, and this is basically not taken into account in any of the recent models. So, and that also explains why machine learning is extremely poor compared to uh, human or even animal capabilities today. And, and this is where, I mean, you said it rightly, machine learning has yet a lot to learn from the brain and we hope to make a contribution there. Many thanks. Uh, many thanks. Any other question, follow up on those? Yes, I give you the mic. Okay, I have seen HPMB three years ago in Lisbon when you actually started. Um, do you do collaborations only in Europe or do you, for example, collaborate in a global level like the MIT Intelligence Quest uh, initiative? And, uh, and also, okay, you're investigating the brain. What are the ethical, what are the ethical things, especially when you do breakthroughs? Yes. And how do you deal with that? Because okay. uh, whatever you're producing might be used for good, it might be used for bad. Definitely. So you have two questions. The first one is about our, our international collaboration. So yes, we are uh, strongly collaborating with something called the International Brain Initiative, which is a group of, uh, of national initiatives and also European and American ones. Uh, so we're, we're collaborating with them. We're trying to set a common agenda for brain research and also for uh, networking activities to make sure that we share data and we share um, re research results. And we are working with um, the US Brain Initiative very closely and since uh, many years. Um, and we are working in Europe also with, um, there's a new project that was just started, funded by the commission, it's called IBRA. Its purpose is to um, coordinate clusters of, uh, of, of projects around the, the world and to to make sure that all these this this information is being shared, so we are actively doing uh, international collaborations. The second question was about the ethical aspect of brain research. In HPP, we've had since the very beginning a strong, um, quite unique focus on on uh, such things. We have uh, we have developed foresight activities to investigate the potential um, uh, consequences of learning about the brain and of simulating the brain. And we are also pursuing um, uh, public engagement. We're doing citizens' conventions to discuss these issues with people from the civil society, from the population, and make sure that everybody is engaged in, in, in with us when we're doing this, such types of research. Many thanks. Any follow-up other questions? So you can meet all these projects in the exhibition area, X5 and X3, I think, if I remember well, and you can discuss now, X4, sorry. And uh, I propose to do a photo family picture. Probably want this. Yeah. 